A.W. Tozer once wrote that what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. He continued to write that we tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. What is your mental image of God like? What comes into your mind when you think about God? What is God like? The author of Hebrews wrote that he, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. In other words, if you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Jesus even said to a group of scribes and Pharisees and teachers of the law, he said, you search the scriptures because you think in them you will find life, but the scriptures point to me. Jesus is the embodiment of the divine nature. And the gospel authors, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, weave together scenes from the life and ministry of Jesus that paint for us a picture of what God is like. Luke, in his gospel, one of the scenes he writes about, he tells about how an expert in the law one time approached Jesus and asked him how can I inherit eternal life? And Jesus, knowing he's an expert in the law, sort of turned the question on him and said, well, you know the law. How do you read and interpret it? And the man said, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you're correct. Do this and you will live. But then Luke tells us that the man wanted to justify his actions and he said, who is my neighbor? You see, legalism is always obsessed with where exactly the boundaries begin and where exactly the boundaries end. And instead of answering him directly, Jesus told a parable. He told a story. You've heard it before. There's a man, he was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho and as he was on his way, there's a group of thugs who attacked him, beat him and left him for dead. It just so happened though, that a priest and a Levite came by that same way, but for whatever reason, they passed by and did not stop and help the man. It's at this point that the story takes a dramatic turn because Jesus introduces the next character, and this character would be the hero of the story. This character that he introduces is the person that exemplifies neighborly love, and it would have been shocking to his Jewish audience. It would be like... If Jesus came to our church today and told a story illustrating neighborly love and the hero of the story he told us was a Muslim. He says, a Samaritan. Samaritans were half-breeds. Their blood was mixed with the blood of pagans. Somewhere in their ancestry, Jews had intermarried with Gentile people. And their religion was just as mixed as their blood. They had mixed and diluted the worship of Yahweh with other rituals and ideologies and pagan things. And so there is intense racial and religious tension between Jews and Samaritans. So as Jesus is sitting there tell, telling a parable about neighborly love and he introduces a Samaritan, the tension amongst the audience, you could almost feel it. He says a Samaritan came by that way and he stopped. He was moved with compassion and he helped the man. He bandaged his, his wounds, put him on his own donkey and took him to a nearby inn where he, of his own resources, paid for this man's care. And Jesus says this, this is what neighborly love looks like. Luke tells of another time when Jesus was the guest of a sinner. He's a guest of a tax collector. Now, Israel, during this time, was under Roman occupation, and so tax collectors collected taxes for Rome. And if you were a Jewish tax collector, if you were a Jew collecting taxes from your own people for Rome, you were the worst kind of traitor. And not only were you a traitor, but you were a thief. You were a thug. You cheated people. Because the taxation system wasn't very exact. It was a little shady. Basically, you had to pay whatever the tax collector said you owed. 
And the tax collector was accountable to Rome for a certain amount. But anything above that amount, they got to pocket. And so they were literally getting rich by extorting their own people, their own flesh and blood Israelites. And one time Jesus was entering the city of Jericho. And there's a man who lived in the city named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. And Zacchaeus was short. But he heard about this Jesus and he wanted to he wanted to see what he was all about. And so he couldn't see over all the crowds of people that were following Jesus as he entered the city of Jericho. So he climbs up in a tree and it's almost as if Jesus were looking for him because as Jesus is walking through the city, he stops, looks up at Zacchaeus and says, Zacchaeus, come down from there. I must be your guest today. To be a guest in someone's home, to share a meal, to Break bread with someone was a social statement. It, it was a sign of mutual acceptance. To sit and eat, to be a guest in someone's home was to say, we belong in relationship together. And Luke tells us that the people who were following him grumbled amongst themselves saying, he's gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner. I mean, how could this rabbi, this teacher of God's word, this man of God, this miracle worker, this potential Messiah, how could he go and be the guest of that guy? But Zacchaeus' life was changed forever. He confesses his sin of cheating people, and he says, I'll pay back four times whatever I've, whatever I've stolen. And Jesus says, this is why I've come to seek and save the lost. It seems Jesus made a habit of breaking the traditions of men and offending the religious elite. Jesus frequently and repeatedly disregarded the letter of the law when the letter of the law missed the heart of law. Jesus disregarded the law when their interpretation of the law disregarded human dignity. Jesus didn't just interact with sinners. He also interacted with the unclean. To be unclean wasn't necessarily a moral thing. Cleanliness and uncleanliness often had to do or had association with life or death. So for example, uh, during a woman's monthly period, she was ceremonially unclean. Or if you had a family member who died and you had to, for some reason, interact with the body, you were ceremonially unclean. Things that were clean were associated with life and were connected to God because he's the source of life. Things that were associated with death or disease or decay were unclean. God wanted his people to understand the difference between God and not God. Clean, unclean, holy, unholy, life and death. But the problem was that there were some diseases that rendered you unclean. And if there were no cure for those diseases, you were perpetually unclean. One of those diseases was leprosy. The word leprosy in our Bibles uh, is actually used for a number of infectious skin diseases. And if you were diagnosed with leprosy, you were, you were unclean. And you were cast out of the community. You were isolated and separated from your family, from your friends, from the community of people that you belong to. You were completely isolated from them. You had to wear torn clothes and you had to cover the bottom half of your face and if people got anywhere near you you had to shout out unclean unclean because you were perpetually unclean you couldn't go to the temple and the temple was the symbolic place of God's presence so you were separated from your friends your family your neighbors and you were separated from God and so this couldn't help but take on certain religious moral implications. I mean, if you are perpetually separated from God, there must be something wrong with you, right? You must somehow be less than. So Mark tells of a time in his gospel when Jesus was ministering in the region of Galilee and a man with leprosy approaches Jesus, something he should not have done. And he comes up to Jesus and he says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And it's almost as if Jesus can't help himself when he sees human brokenness. His heart is moved to compassion and Jesus does something unprecedented. He reaches out 
and he touches him. Can you imagine what this would have been like? You've been isolated from any form of human contact for who knows how long. And Jesus reaches out and he touches the man. But he's not just any person. God in the flesh reached out, bringing upon himself, according to the law, his own defilement by coming in contact with him. And he touches the man and he says, I am willing to. Be clean. And the skin disease was healed. For over three years, the disciples followed Jesus and they heard his teachings about loving your neighbor. They heard the parable about the good Samaritan and the prodigal son. And they heard Jesus say things like, love your enemies and do good to those who hurt you and pray for those who would persecute you. And he, they heard him say things like, forgive 70 times, seven times, which is really a figure of speech for saying, forgive people as many times as it takes. They followed Jesus as they went to be the guests of tax collectors and sinners. And they went into these, these people's homes and they're following Jesus here, probably wondering as they're going, what are we doing here? They followed Jesus into Gentile territory, leaving the boundaries of Israel and going into Gentile cities. And they watched as Jesus healed people in those towns, as he delivered people from demonic oppression in those towns, as he preached the kingdom of God, that it is available even to those people. And they followed Jesus into these places. And this picture of what God is like would come into focus for all of the disciples, except maybe one of them. But just in case it wasn't becoming clear what God's heart was like, three days before Jesus' death, he tells a series of parables. And we're going to look at one of them this morning. If you have Bibles, I invite you to turn there or devices. If not, I'm going to read it from uh, my Bible. It's in Matthew chapter 25. This is the week, this is Passion Week, the week of Passover. We believe about three days before Jesus would be crucified. And the context of this parable is the final judgment. And to Matthew 25, I'm going to begin reading in verse 31. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Keep in mind the disciples, it's been about three years or maybe a little more that they've been following Jesus. They've been seeing this picture of what God's heart is like. In verse 31, Jesus says, But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence, and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, You who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Then the king will turn to those on his left and say, away With you, you cursed ones into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. Then they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth. When you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. This is one of those uncomfortable teachings of Jesus. I say uncomfortable because if we're ever really comfortable with the idea that there will be people who will ultimately reject the gift of God's grace in Jesus Christ, if we're comfortable with that idea, I think we might 
miss even the heart of God because as the scripture we read at the beginning, God is slow to anger. He's abounding in compassion. And God even says in different places, he does not delight in punishing the wicked. This is one of those uncomfortable passages where we're confronted with the reality that there are going to be people who reject God's gift of salvation and those who accept it. And I want to point out that this is a parabolic teaching of Jesus. It is a parable, so it's important not to impose on it uh, some, some idea that is meant to be an exhaustive doctrinal theological teaching on the final judgment. It's not a teaching of salvation by works. But I believe what Jesus is teaching us is how followers of Christ should treat other people. And I believe what it does teach is the same grace that saves us is the same grace that changes us. That as we follow Jesus and as the Spirit of God more and more saturates our lives, we begin to bear fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. These things begin to be characteristic of the life of those who are following Jesus because the Holy Spirit, the grace that saves us, is the grace that changes us. And it is important to note, I think, that the sheep in this parable are characterized by how they treated people. When you study the language that is used, the idea of someone being hungry or thirsty or without clothing, it's the idea that they're destitute. They are poor. They do not have the basic needs. And I just want to point out, Jesus doesn't have a little asterisk with a a little exception that you only help them once they've sufficiently proven that they've done their best to get a job and fend for themselves. He says, listen, they're thirsty, they're hungry, they're naked. My sheep are characterized by how they care for those people. The word stranger in this context, you can study this if you don't believe me, but it carries more than just the idea of someone you don't know. It actually carries the idea of a foreigner, an alien. The hospitality we show people who are different from us matters. And if you've ever cared for anyone who is sick, you know that it it means denying some of your own needs and wants and waiting and caring for them. Or someone in prison implies someone who's broken the law. They deserve what they got, right? But Jesus says, my sheep are characterized by how they treat these people. And the goats are characterized by how they do not treat these people. And I think the overwhelming message that we get from Jesus as we follow him through the Gospels is that we're called to love people, but the scriptures highlight for us certain groups of people sometimes because no matter what culture, no matter what time in history you are part of, we have this human tendency to categorize and evaluate people's worth. And so the scriptures point and shine a light. We're called to love all people, but especially those people that it's hard to love sometimes. We need to be mindful of that. The scriptures shine a light repeatedly from the Old Testament to the New Testament on specifically the poor. Jesus says, you are to treat people as if they're me. At the end of December, Emily and I had the opportunity to go to the International Wesleyan Youth Conference. And uh, there were students from all over the world. Uh, It happens every four years. Students from all over the world that gathered. There were students and adult leaders. And there were about 7,000 of us who gathered for three days. And we worshiped together. And we listened to preaching together. And me and my wife, we had just an awesome time. It was a lot of fun. And it's really encouraging. Even though it's kind of directed at teenagers, I got a lot out of the time worshiping together and hearing the messages. And uh, it, was, it was a good time. But one of the things that is not as good of a time for me is um, I'm not as young as I was when I first started out as the youth pastor here. I'm not, I'm not the youth pastor anymore. My wife and I are um, adult leaders. But one of the things that's not as easy for me is um, staying up late. And um, lights out was at midnight. So um, we didn't often get to bed till even after that. And then we were up between 6 a.m. and 7 a.m. every day. And those of you who know me, you know I have a fondness of coffee, to say the least. The hotel had free coffee at the breakfast in the morning, um, but sometimes you get what you pay for. And uh, I drank it, you know. I drank it anyways, free coffee in the morning, but also by the afternoon, I often kind of wanted to pick me up. So uh, one afternoon, we were at the conference and we were at the convention center and we had a little bit of a break uh, to 
before we had to be at our next seminar. So I pull up my phone and I'm scrolling looking for a nearby Starbucks and I find that there's one within walking distance. So I say, um, me and my wife, we're going to go. I say, hey, we're going to go make a Starbucks run. Anyone want to go with us? And a couple of adults and students are like, yeah, yeah, we want to we go. So um, we all got together and we left the convention center on our uh, adventure off-site heading for the Starbucks. And if you've been to a larger city, you know that it's not uncommon to walk by and see um, homeless people all over the streets. And I want to make a comment for a moment. I know it's not possible to help every homeless person you come in contact with. I know sometimes it's not prudent to give money, but I have the policy and the conviction of my own life that I want to begin with an open hand of generosity and then filter that generosity through discernment rather than begin with a closed hand and mask it as discernment. But it's really an excuse not to give. And what I've found is a lot of times God makes it very clear because I'm a millennial. I never have cash on me, ever. And so there are times where people approach me and ask if they can have some money, and I, I have to tell them, I, I really, I don't have any money on me. I have offered, I could take you in if we're close to like a restaurant, I could take you in and buy you something. And sometimes I've had people take me up on that offer. Other times people said, no, I don't, I don't want that. And I, I don't feel any conviction of the Holy Spirit for not, I really could not. But there have been other times where for whatever reason, I did have cash in my wallet. And I've been approached by someone, and I felt the Holy Spirit prompt me and say, you don't have an excuse. Give them the cash in your wallet. Okay, <laughs> I actually have cash on me this time. Maybe it's not a coincidence. Well, this particular time that we're in Cincinnati and we're heading to Starbucks with the students, a gentleman approaches us and asks us for a hot cup of coffee. We're actually on our way to go get coffee right now. We would love to buy you a cup of coffee. So we head to the Starbucks. Uh, we got, you know, asked him what he wanted. Head to the Starbucks to order his cup of coffee, order my l very large cup of coffee myself. And then we start to head back and we run into him and give him his cup of coffee. And he says, thank you. And he says, I would love to give you a gift just to show my appreciation if you have the time. And this was one of the days that it would act, it, the temperature had actually dropped significantly. And we're outside and I'm thinking, man, we really don't have the time. I'm freezing. But I said, yeah, we would appreciate that. He says, I'm a poet. I'd love to recite you a poem about our Lord. So they're standing in the street, a group of us kind of gather around and we're shivering and stuff, but he recites this poem and it really was a beautiful poem about God's love and what God is like and it was just really well composed. And afterwards he said, man, what's your name? He said, Donnie. And I said, Donnie, can we pray for you? And we asked him what we could pray for and um, I put my hand on his shoulder and I prayed for him. And then just before we headed back to the convention center, he said, he looked and said, hey, thank you for stopping and acknowledging me. A lot of people walk on by and ignore me, and it makes me feel inadequate. How many people in our world feel inadequate and need to know that there is a God who loves them? Growing up, my mom was a licensed beautician, and so um, she cut my hair. I had free haircuts, like, my entire life until I moved to Warsaw. And so we moved to Warsaw, and I'm like, I'm not going to wait till the next time I visit my parents or they visit us to get a haircut. So I looked up and found a place in town that was known for taking walk-ins and doing kind of quick haircuts. But I quickly found that not um, every hairstylist is created equal because I would walk in and I'd get a different stylist every time and some of them care a little bit more about men's haircuts than others it would seem because I would sometimes come home and realize there was like some mist, there was like some strays. I'm like, ah, that doesn't look good. But then one time I got uh, this girl, we're gonna say her name's Melissa. And Melissa um, took a lot longer than the other ones but she was very particular. Like I got the sense like this girl's a perfectionist. And I liked how she cut my hair. So instead of walking into this place and getting whoever, I started calling and setting up an appointment with Melissa. But Melissa, it was a little awkward because um, she was really shy and quiet. And you're sitting in that chair for a long time. And I know I'm a pastor and I'm supposed to be able to engage people and stuff. But some of you have maybe already discovered this. I'm actually a little bit socially awkward. And... So there were times where it was kind of uncomfortable sitting in this chair with this hairstylist that is also really shy and quiet. But over time, we got to know each other. And we got to the point where um, I'd be able to ask her how I could pray for her. Um, Melissa was uh, Hispanic. 
and uh, her husband was an undocumented immigrant from Mexico. And one of the times she shared something uh, that I could pray about. I don't remember all the details. I don't understand all of it either. Even this week, I tried to research to kind of understand what they were going through, but it's kind of confusing. But one of the things she asked me to pray about was they were trying to go through the process of obtaining legal status for her husband. And the only thing I remember as she described it to me is it was really expensive, it was really complicated, and there was the potential that her husband, because he had been here so long illegally, could be penalized and sent back to Mexico and barred from coming back to the United States for 10 years. Now, I want to be clear, I don't condone that he came here illegally, but I have to tell you, in that moment, as I'm talking to someone who's cut my hair for several months now, and I'm listening to her, I can't help but empathize and imagine what would it be like to be separated from my wife for 10 years. And that issue began to take on a face. It had a person's name connected to it. Some of you this week, uh, you may have seen in the newspaper that our lead pastor, Pastor Jared is the jail chaplain. He's been uh, serving at the jail in the jail ministry for a couple months now. He goes every week uh, for about an hour and he sits in a room with eight to 12 guys or eight to 10 guys and he talks about Jesus, literally as a captive audience, right? And oftentimes, that was a terrible joke. (laughs) That was bad. A lot of times Jared will share with me the next day um, some of the highlights of that time. We try to share encouraging stories with one another so we stay, you know, (laughs) encouraged in the work of ministry and things. And um, one of the times he shared with me uh, that uh, he had taught about forgiveness. And after teaching about forgiveness, um, he was about to leave. His time of kind of leading the discussion and the talk was over. And uh, one of the guys came up to him and said, I... I think I need to forgive someone. And uh, he said, who do you need to forgive? He said, I I think I need to forgive my dad. His dad had actually died a a couple weeks before this, but Jared asked him, "Uh, what do you you need to forgive your dad for? I'm going to quote him exactly. He said, I need to forgive my dad for beating the shit out of me when I was a kid. Jared said, you want to do that? He said, yeah, but I don't know how. Jesus said, well, we could start by praying. Would you like to do that? He said, yeah. I should probably also forgive my uncles for molesting me when I was a kid. It's really easy to have a lot of assumptions about people who are felons. But no kid should ever, no child should ever be beaten by their father. There have been different times in my life where I've had assumptions and prejudices and ideas and opinions about every single one of the people in these situations. And to my shame, I've been part of conversations where people talked about homeless people and would say things like, you know, if you're homeless in America, it's because you're lazy. You know, if you, this is a land of opportunity. If you just apply yourself and try really hard, you can make something of yourself. But then I sat across from homeless people and I heard their stories and it became clear to me that if not for the grace of God, their story could be mine. To my shame, I've been part of conversations where people said things like, you know, I don't care that they're over here, but if they're going to be here, they need to learn to speak English and other hateful things about other people. And I was part of those conversations. To my shame, I've had self-righteous pride about people who were convicted and in jail, or had a record. But God, through my life and my ministry, I have encountered people, and I've sat across from them, and I've heard their stories, and their stories have actually impacted me and changed me. And then when I look at the life of Jesus, I see time and time and time and time and time again in the Gospels where Jesus confronts those prejudices in us and calls us to love people to love people, and he does it with this radical, ridiculous compassion and grace. And so I've tried to make it my practice. And church, I want to be clear, just in case you've only listened to parts, I want to make sure everyone hears me say this. I do not do this perfectly. I've been here for 
going on nine years, so there have probably been times, those of you who have seen me, where I did not model it perfectly as a pastor. There are probably things you could point to sometime that I did or said somewhere sometime that you could say, he's a hypocrite. I don't do this perfectly, but I've made it my desire to encounter people with enough humility and grace that there is space for compassion to infect my heart. And church, this gets real for us. Because as our Hispanic ministry grows, and there are people who walk through our doors who, frankly, look a little different than most of us in this room, or talk a little different than most of us, we need to be willing and ready to embrace them as brothers and sisters in Christ. And if we were to find out about their story, that they're not documented, does that change anything for you? Should it? As some of these guys get out of the jail and they think, you know what? I need to get in church. I'll check out that church that that Jared guy who's been spending an hour a week with us, I'm going to check his church out. And as they walk through our doors and they got tattoos all over their body and they're wearing clothes that you maybe wouldn't wear to church and if they're a little forward with their story and they tell you how they heard about it, well, I met Jared in the jail. Would you invite them to sit with you during service? Would you invite them to your life group? Would you be willing to pour into them and disciple them and invest in them? Or upon finding out their story, would we distance ourselves from them? Um, maybe we can't trust them, right? This is, this is real and relevant for us as a church community because these are things that are very much at the forefront of what God is doing in the life of our church. But maybe you're here and maybe loving people who are different from you or immigrants or people who are out of prison, maybe that's not hard for you. Maybe you're here and if you're honest, you actually have a hard time loving people you would consider Pharisees, you know, like the legalistic Christians. And, and if you're honest, you really love when Jesus goes after him. But I just want to point out, Jesus was harsh with them, but Jesus loved them too. Or maybe you're here and um, maybe you have assumptions about white people and it's hard for you to love them. I, I, I don't know, but the overwhelming message of Jesus is that God's heart is for people, all people. And we've been tasked, we've been sent as bearers of that message. But Scripture highlights and calls us to pay attention to those people who are sometimes particularly hard to love. And so we're going to close the service like we do and have been every week of the series. We're going to close with communion. There's a guide on page 36 that you can go through with your table. But after you're done taking communion, I challenge you to take a few moments and reflect on these questions that will be on the screen. Who are the least of these in your life? Who are the people in your life that if you were honest with yourself, you find it hard to love? And maybe some of you don't have to look very far. Maybe there's a family member that you find it hard to love. I don't know, but who are the people in your life that you find it hard to love? And then reflect on this question. To what degree does your heart align with the heartbeat of Jesus? Is there dissonance there? Is there conflict there? Maybe I've said something that ruffled your feathers, and it could be that I said something foolish or flippant. I'm a human. Or it could be that there's tension there because God's trying to call something out in you. To what degree does your heart align with the heartbeat of Jesus. Take communion together at your tables and then take a few minutes to reflect on these questions.
want to invite you to bow your heads with me. And um, I want to offer a couple of responses that you can do in your seat there. Maybe you're here this morning and you identify with a person that feels inadequate. Or you identify with someone who feels estranged, cut off, or maybe you have a past. And what you need to hear this morning is that there's a God who loves you, who died to forgive your past and rewrite your future and give you a hope. And if you've never responded to that message, but you know you need to this morning, I want to give an opportunity for that. And so I just want to invite everyone to bow their heads and I just want to lead through a prayer. It's not a formula, but it's just sort of a template just to help with maybe the words that you might need. But if you're here this morning and you need the love of God, the grace of Jesus, the forgiveness that is offered in him to to flood into your life and you need reconciled to your creator God, that can happen in this moment. His forgiveness is available. So let's invite you to pray this with me. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I receive your gift of salvation. Be Lord of my life and make me new. In Jesus' name. Maybe you're here this morning and um, there's some conviction and uh, there's someone in your life or a group of people. uh, Maybe you need to forgive them. Maybe they've wronged you. But you've been carrying around just sort of this burden of bitterness. And the Spirit's saying it's time to let it go. Or maybe you're here and if you are honest, you have a tendency to sort of hold tightly opinions about people that are maybe true or maybe just stereotypes, but the Holy Spirit's nudge that there's a tendency to just view people through a lens that is not really consistent with the lens that God sees people through. First, I want to give you the opportunity to ask God for forgiveness. To forgive you for not loving as he loves. And then ask him by his spirit to love people through you. To give you the power, the the capacity to love people the way he does. Because church, the reason we preach about this, the reason it's in scripture, the reason we have to talk about it is because we're human and it goes against so many things that are natural to us. It's hard to love people the way God does. So God, forgive us when we don't do that well. God, forgive us for withholding forgiveness and grace from people when you have been so generous to us. Forgive us. And Spirit, empower us this week as we are sent Spirit, saturate our lives with a love that is not our own, but is a love that is your love, actually. Do that in your people, even now, God. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you to stand with me. May the love of God the peace of Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you as you go. You are sent.